My name is Gregory Soner. I'm the Emergency Medicine Fellow, Ultrasound Fellow for this year. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started kind of a quicker presentation, but uh, we'll get things started. So um, essentially, obviously the topic is going to be serrated anterior plane blocks. Um, it's going to be used for rib fractures. And this is already an established um, practice that, that can be used for pain control. Um, but I'm going to be starting a study. Well, I'm already starting the study. We just need to start to get um, those things rolling, but maybe doing a study on the use of serratus plane blocks in refractures to see if we can reduce uh, opioid usage, as well as looking at patient-centered outcomes like hospital like to stay, um, and so on. And so the purpose of this lecture is to get everybody kind of up to speed with what we're doing and get people to want to join the study. Um, so obviously this is a picture of a rib fracture and we know that rib fractures are very painful. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult to obtain adequate analgesia for these patients. Um, and the opioid crisis is a problem. And you know, the last thing any of us wants to do is to get someone addicted to pain medicine because um, those can be difficult to treat. Um, so you know, the question arises, well, what other you know, opportunities are there for non-opioid analgesia? And there does exist this does exist in the form of nerve blocks. Um, and there are a variety of different nerve blocks that can be used for rib fractures, um, depending on the location of them. Um, however, we're gonna be focusing on the easiest one to do, which is the serratus anterior plane block. Um, so as you can see here, there's a bunch of different uh, ones you can do specific to pecs. Um, you can do a deep serratus block. You can also do the director's spinae block. Um, which are different ways of providing analgesia to the thorax. Um, and some of those are more complicated than some of the other ones. Um, they're just a little bit more difficult. Some of the deeper structures, you know, closer to the lung. Um, but what's nice about the serratus plane block is it's actually one of the easiest ones to do. And you're the furthest away from the actual pleural lining. So the risk of pneumothorax is much lower, um, obviously, which is operator dependent, but um, it's, it's really quite a simple block to do. Um, as far as nerve blocks, it's one of the easiest ones to perform. And I'll get into how to do that. Um, so here's kind of a picture of the you know, nerve innervations of the thorax. As you can see, there's you know, a variety of different nerves innervate a lot of the muscles um, surrounding the thorax. And um, the ribs themselves are primarily innervated by the intercostal nerves. Uh, but the intercostal nerves themselves have cutaneous branches. Uh, which we can see kind of coming across the, the chest here. Um, and that's what we're going to end up targeting with the serratus block is those cutaneous nerve branches. Um, and when there's a, a, a fracture or, or other traumatic pathology, you know, um, you just, there's some disruption in some of the fascial planes. So some of that anesthetic can reach some of the deeper structures and get down and actually anesthetize some of the intercostal nerves as well, providing additional hemorrhagia. Um, and so like I said here, we're going to be targeting the cutaneous branches. So the, the intercostal nerves themselves have a cutaneous branch that comes up um, and lies between the serratus anterior muscle and the latissimus dorsi muscle. And that's exactly where we're going to be putting the anesthetic right here. And therefore, we're going to be targeting this branch. And hopefully, some of this anesthetic can kind of work its way back to the nerve and get some of the uh, intercostal nerves as well. And, and like I said, when you have disruption of some of these muscles, uh, the intercostal muscles can be disrupted in cases of fracture, then obviously that's going to allow for some of that anesthetic to get down here and directly hit this nerve as well. So um, that's why it's, it's a really useful nerve block for rib fractures. Um, and it's something that's been known to be used, but is not commonly used. And hoping uh, that this study will help to kind of promote more ED usage of the serratus plane block, uh, especially given how easy it is to perform. Um, so essentially, um, the target area that we're going to be looking at is going to be right here along the chest, um, along the lateral wall. And you have the latissimus dorsi muscle that comes up and comes across here. You can see this is essentially the fascial plane in between the serratus and latissimus dorsi. And that's where we're going to be depositing the anesthetic. And essentially, when the patient uh, breathes, that anesthetic is going to get spread across that fascial plane, and it's going to provide analgesia to most of the ribs, um, which is exactly what we wanted to do. 
Um, and, and that's kind of a, a common theme amongst nerve blocks in general. Um, a lot of times we're putting anesthetic into fascial planes or putting it into you know, sheaths that nerves exist in and the kind of the bathing of that, uh, that area provides the analgesia. So uh, it's exactly what we're doing here in this situation. So you're gonna need um, some equipment, obviously. Um, the most important thing you're gonna need is the anesthetic. You're gonna need bucubicine. You can use 0.5% uh, or you can use 0.25%. Um, obviously keeping in mind that the lower concentration is not gonna be as strong, but what you can do is use more of that. So um, you can kind of go both ways with this, um, with this particular block. So, um, you know, really in general, there's no harm in, in having a more dilute solution because you could have more of it and it could spread across the whole fascial plane. So certain nerve blocks, you're gonna want the more concentrated solution because you can only put so much total volume of anesthetic um, in a smaller area. Um, but for this block, there's a lot of room for the anesthetic to spread around. So it's perfectly acceptable to use 0.25%, just use more of it. Um, and, or you can use 0.5% and mix it with saline. Um, but you're gonna be targeting around 20 mLs of total volume uh, into that fascial plane. Um, now you can use two different types of needles. Um, the most widely available needle is going to be your 20 gauge spinal needle, um, which is a great needle. Um, I don't recommend using the 22 gauge because they're flimsy and they can bend. Um, and I really don't like using them. So I like to use 20 gauge. Um, and you can also use the nerve block needle if you have them available, which we do have some in the ultrasound office. Um, and we'll try to make some kits for the study that we can have pre packaged in a designated area so that when you want to go perform the block, you'll have the needle and the syringe and the chloroprep, and ultrasound cover, the gloves, all in one place. So you can just go grab that quickly so you can do the block um, quick and easy. Um, so you'll need to have that. So the nerve block needle is uh, advantageous because uh, it's nice and long. So it provides you easy access to the target uh, area that you're trying to get to. And it's also designed to light up on ultrasound, so you'll, you'll be able to visualize that needle uh, very nicely if you're using the nerve block needle because it lights up very nicely on ultrasound. Um, so, and it also has kind of a, a, a extended tubing. So you will need a second operator if you're performing it with the nerve block needle um, because you're not gonna be able to push the anesthetic at the same time that you're guiding your needle location. Um, so you will need a second provider if you're going to use this technique. Um, and if you're, if you happen to have a nerve stimulator, it also has a second hookup here, this, this other hookup right here, go right to the nerve stimulator and you can do a little electrical stimuli, um, not as necessary for the straightest block, but for other nerve blocks, um, if you want to be sure that you're not directly in the nerve or uh, you're not in the muscle and you want to make sure you're in the right location, you can use the nerve block stimulator um, and that will provide a obviously a muscular twitch if you're in the muscle or nerve. So it's a good way to help to kind of localize uh, your needle location if you're having troubles visualizing the tip when you're doing the ultrasound. Um, I prefer this needle. Um, it's, it's just easier to use um, because especially um, you know, depending on you know, how, how, you, how large of someone's hands are and holding the, the syringe and also manipulating the needle at the same time it can be easier if you just have to worry about the needle and you have a second person who can help to uh, you know, administer the medication, uh, also capture the images on ultrasound good as well. Um, so I prefer this needle. Uh, you will need a 20 gauge syringe. You'll need a sterile ultrasound cover, some sterile gloves and chloroprep or beta nine or whatever you want to use to uh, sterilize the skin. And of course the good me. So you want to go ahead and have the patient positioned in the lateral uh, decubitus position if possible. You can also perform this in the supine position. Um, but it's easier if you have the patient lie on their side. Um, so you're going to essentially locate the area that you would put a chest tube in, you know, around the, around the nipple line uh, in the mid axillary position. And you're gonna place the probe onto the patient's chest. Uh, now the indication for the, or the, or the side of the indicator is gonna be dependent on which hemithorax you're performing the procedure. And in general, when you're doing ultrasound guided procedures, you wanna have the indicator facing your left. 
Um, so if you're if you happen to ha be you know positioned on the other side of the, on the right side of the patient, the left side of the patient, or depending on you know how the patient's positioned and where you are physically located, you always want that indicator to be on your left, so that when you're performing the procedure, um, it's just much easier to be able to manipulate the needle and know exactly where it is um, if it's oriented towards you. Um, so that that way your your needle's coming in from the left. If you're coming in from the left you'll see it on the left side of your screen. It's just a lot easier to do. So um, that's a quick tip, but just always keep that indicator facing your left. Uh, so it's easier for you to localize that. Um, so you're gonna go ahead and locate the anatomy. Um, so what you're gonna see when you throw the probe on is you're gonna see several different things. So obviously you're gonna see the plural lines, you're gonna see the ribs, um, and that's gonna help you, you know, lo locate how deep um, you know, the plural line is, you, you're keeping in mind, uh, again, on the side of the ultrasound machine, you're going to see indicators, so you'll know exactly how many centimeters down it is, um, so that you don't cause new infarcts, which you don't want. You'll see a linear band of tissue running across uh, anterior to the rib, and that's going to be the serratus anterior muscle. Then you're going to see the latissimus dorsi muscle coming in from the side. Um, now, as you, if you were to move this probe more posteriorly, you'd see more of the latissimus dorsi muscle. And as you move anteriorly, eventually you'll, you'll see that muscle disappear. Um, and it's it's easy to target the area kind of where that latissimus dorsi muscle comes in. So you can kind of see it in the corner of the screen. Um, it makes it really easy to locate the fascial plane that's between the serratus anterior and latissimus dorsi. And that's where you're gonna be depositing that anesthetic, right between those two muscles, uh, right in that fascial plane. and there is um, a thoracodorsal artery that sometimes pops up. It's pretty small. Um, but other than that, you don't really have anything worrisome to avoid as long as you don't go too deep and puncture the lung, which is hard to do. If you, if you watch your needle, um, you'll know where it is. And uh, it's really uh, kind of a good procedure, if, if not, not too much difficulty. Um, so I have a video here. Uh, it should play automatically. I'll show you guys. All right, um, yeah, that is that one. Okay, uh, that concludes the lecture. Uh, essentially, does anyone have any questions?